Well, thanks for uh, joining us for another extended review on Your Movie Friend. And today we're looking at the movie Trouble with the Curve. Clint Eastwood, Amy Adams, Justin Timberlake, and uh, kind of getting into the heat of Oscar season. Uh, joined by Jeremy Scott, as always. My friend Jeremy and I love to talk movies, and so thanks for coming along for the ride. We will get right into it with some general thoughts, some questions for each other, our worst thing and our best thing, and then we will finish with letting you know when we think you should see Trouble with the Curve. Jeremy, what did you think? <sighs> um, last week's movie was so bad that it's hard for me to say this movie is bad. <laughs> Just as a reminder, that was Resident Evil Retribution. It was. Uh, this is the kind of movie that needs to exist so we understand the difference between truly bad movies and truly good movies. Okay. It has to be something in the middle, and that's this movie. Fair enough. Fair enough. So it was kind of middle of the road for you. We'll talk specifics in a little bit. But for me overall, generally, I think I liked it a little more than you. I would put it a little ahead of middle of the road. Uh, primarily on the back of some pretty good performances mm -hmm. in this movie. Uh, Eastwood and Adams especially, I think, are really at the top of their game in this, which is really interesting for Clint Eastwood because he is so stinking old. Yeah. But he, yeah. He, he had some scenes where he delivered in this movie. He does, and, and the early scenes, which are setting the stage for, for his age and his crankiness, obviously, but they actually pulled me out of the movie a little bit. I, I was surprised to see him looking and acting that old. And I don't know how much of that was makeup and how much it, I mean, it's just human nature. We get old, but it made me a little bit sad to think about a future with, you know, without a Clint Eastwood. Oh, that's interesting. So you're wondering even if he played older than he really is at heart? Yeah. Like, I don't know. It's been, I mean, he, he seems so much older in this than he has in even stuff in the last couple of years. It felt to me that it could have been makeup or it could have been, you know, costume or something, but man, he looked old. Interesting. I, I didn't see, I, see, it felt to me a lot like Gran Torino. Like, it felt like the same kind of old guy character. I think he has maybe more energy in Gran Torino because that character is a little, even a little more aggressive. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, um, but yeah, I didn't notice that. But that's, that's an interesting point. And it is sad because, I mean, Eastwood, I mean, he's been around a long time and it's been amazing to see kind of the transition of his career. And I mean, make no mistake. This is this is an Eastwood vehicle, right? This oh, is a yeah. oh yeah. Well, and I liked the callback to his younger career in the, in right. the flashback scene where they they used. I don't even know what that footage is from, but it's clearly from another movie he did in the '60s or '70s. And uh, it, it's just a quick little cut, but it's perfectly used. Uh, but again, just underscores how old, how much he's slowing down. Um, so yeah, I think you know when I call the movie middle of the road, I have to agree with you that the that the two lead performances were great. Uh, and, and they're the good that makes my assessment call it middle of the road. What bothered me the most overall was sort of the contrivances. I felt like the story was one cliche after another, uh, often only appearing to be there just to get the characters from one place to another and not because that scene made any difference. And so I, was, I thought that was every bit as uninspired as the performances were inspired. I, I agree that, that there were a lot of contrivances, and I did notice that, and, um, I, I, you know, the, the movie is very much paint by numbers in that way. It feels very much like, okay, we know, we went to script writing school, we know, you know, where to put, there's nothing nuanced about what's going on here, so. You know, I, I have to make the comparison. In the, within the movie, there's a, there's a character Eastwood squares off with who's a young, a young talent scout that is more into sabermetrics and computers and, and analyzing players that way. And the Eastwood is more of the, you have to get out there and see it and know the game and you have to have heart. And I really feel like this movie could, could double that analogy because it has no heart to the story. It's very, like, I feel like a computer could have spat out the plot of this by just pulling from random baseball and romantic comedy cliches. Uh, it didn't feel like the story had a lot of heart. The performances on the other hand did. So I like that. That's good. I, I, I was struggling in thinking about how to talk about this movie with how not to use baseball metaphors when, <laughs> when explaining this movie. And then I gave up and figured I would. Uh, yeah. to, me, to me, it's like um, the pitcher who tips his pitch. Like, so much of it, you know what's coming. And if you're going to be a pitcher who tips his pitches, which, by the way, is a plot point in the movie as well. Yes. But if you're going to be a pitcher who tips his pitches, you better have good pitches. And I felt like this movie... Uh, with those performances, 
had the pitches to make it work even though they were tipped slightly. Yes. Not not magnificently, but slightly gave it the edge to be able to pull it off. Yeah, the problem for me wasn't that the movie was was telegraphing where it was going as much as it was just where where it was going wasn't very interesting or original. Let's talk let's talk about the uh, let's talk about the acting. We mentioned Eastwood and Adams, yeah. which I think we both agree were were really good. What about Justin Timberlake? Um I'm on the fence, man, because his storyline was the most contrived to me. Um, the, it felt very much. It felt very much there just to have a romantic interest. Yeah, yeah, right? and and shoehorned in at every opportunity. Like we've got to get these two characters on a date. Let's just have Clint Eastwood tell them to go on a date. That'll work. And then once they're on a date, we have we have to have some fun. So let's just have spontaneous clogging break out in the bar that they're in. <laughs> it was one cliche you know, easy script thing after another. So it's hard for me. I also, I also th thought he was miscast. I really like Justin Timberlake, even as an actor, but I feel like he was, he was miscast terribly. He didn't feel like a former baseball player authentically was terrible at baseball announcing, which is what he's apparently. <laughs> uh, it, it just felt like let's put Justin Timberlake in this at all costs. Uh, I think, I think you're right about the clogging. That was ridiculous. Uh, you're right about the announcing. Um, you know, it just, it was like, really? I mean, it felt like an SNL sketch, you know, yeah. at some points. And maybe a that's just... an announcer who thinks he's good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly right. And maybe it's just because I associate him so much with SNL from his performances. But um, I'm a fan. I'm a Justin Timberlake fan. Like, I think he's the real deal. I think he's one of the first triple threats we've really had in the entertainment industry in a long time. You yeah. know, it really feels like he's a very gifted guy in a lot of ways. And I think he... The fact that he's standing up against Clint Eastwood and Amy Adams, that's a tough thing to pull off. And I remember thinking some of the same things with uh, Jonah Hill in Moneyball. Mm. You know, here's, here's a guy that, that's now standing up against these actors like Paul Giamatti and you know all these guys and having to hold his own and, uh, and manages to do it okay, you know? Yeah. And that's how I felt about Timberlake in this. And um, I, think, I think you're right. I think he just needs a better role. Yeah, he's totally likable in this and in anything else. He had a, a fine level of chemistry with Amy Adams. Even you know, the, All the issues I have with his performance go back to what they scripted his character to do uh, and, and maybe the casting. Um, so, you know, what, 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 about, what about some of the other roles? Are there even any other roles worth noting? Matthew Lillard? Or? Matthew Lillard. Yeah, that was the one I wanted to bring up. I actually, I actually really enjoyed that, and I don't know why. I, Interesting, yeah. It's, it is interesting because it's a very um, over-the-top performance in, in some ways, but I, don't, I, I, don't, I really liked him in The Descendants, too. Like, yeah. he's really, there's something about his, his facial expressions, I think. He really, he, he has a little bit of texture underneath the delivery. I think if there's one thing that grates on me about him, it's the vocal delivery that he uses. Yeah, It's a little weird and over the top, okay. but I think expressively, he does a great job. It's funny that you say that, and, and, and I'll have to watch it again at some point and, and pay attention to that difference because, you know, I, I watched The Descendants not very long ago for the first time and was really, really surprised by him because he was great and he didn't try to do any of his usual showy, comic, goofy stuff. Right. Uh, and I felt like in this movie he he went right back to playing his screen character, but it's interesting. I wasn't looking at the expressiveness or his eyes, or I, it was all that vocal intonation for me. And, and he might as well have been the same actor from twelve years ago in Scream, reading these lines. Or Scooby Doo. Or Scooby Doo. <laughs> uh, I, I really liked John Goodman, but I am an admitted John Goodman fan. There's not much he's done that I haven't liked him in. Um, and yeah, and he did. He wasn't asked to do a lot in this, but I thought he was great. Always worried that the man's going to die of a heart attack every time I see him. <laughs> He's that's kind of that's kind of his deal. Um, all right, let's move. Let's move on to uh, questions for you, and uh, I will let you start this time. What's your question for me? Okay. Well, I have four written down. Some were comedic. We'll go with a straight one. Do, do you think that, like the movie Brave by Pixar, that this movie might play better than it does to you and me? to an audience of daughters or daughters with father relationship histories or issues. Because that kept going through my head the whole time was, oh, how would I be reacting to this if I was seeing it through the eyes of Amy Adams, uh, which I obviously wasn't doing. Yeah, and I'm a dad with only sons. So, yeah. you know, I don't have an inkling of that father-daughter relationship. I thought the same thing. 
Um, I saw it with a fairly full audience of pretty much 50 and over people because yeah. yeah. it was a matinee. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, and they seemed really into it and, and to really enjoy it. And I think a lot of it does have to do with that either, you see, I can't place myself in Clint Eastwood's mind and I can't place myself in Amy Adams' mind. Right. But if you can, I imagine this is an extremely powerful movie. Yeah, I would imagine it would because they're both so good and I thought the best scenes were the one or two times they actually talk about their issues. Yes. Uh, that was the best stuff. And so if I had any of those issues, if I could identify more closely with either of those characters, you know, I might have walked out giving it a B plus and instead of a C or something. I don't know. It could have, yeah. could have definitely impacted me different. What's your question? Well, throw one of your funny ones at me before I do mine. Oh, just the Timberlake one. Do you think maybe he's the worst baseball announcer in the history of baseball <laughs> Yes, the answer yeah. is yes. All right, here's my question for Jeremy. Okay. Who do you prefer, Clint Eastwood the actor or Clint Eastwood the director? It's really interesting. Uh, you've trumped me again with another good deep question, and I'm going to get you next week. Um, <laughs> he has clunkers on both fronts, but right. I'm a little more interested in the director, I guess, than I am the actor, because I think the actor is too often typecast. If I'm perfectly honest, he's great in this. But but this is formulaic. We've got a cranky old guy who's going to toss out one-liners and be angry. Who should we get? Clint Eastwood. There's nobody else to get. Whereas when he directs, I feel like he gets into other kinds of stories that his acting career will never touch. I think I agree with you. Um, although I do have a really soft spot in my heart for Eastwood, the actor. Um, even in stuff as seemingly forgettable is, what is that movie? The Perfect World with Kevin Costner and Clint Eastwood? What is, what is it? <laughs> Blood Work? That was one of my least favorite Eastwood. Oh, yeah. No, he's, I just remember, we always used to quote Eastwood lines, like from A Perfect World, there's, he says, I do like tater tots, or something like that, and, you know, I just, there's something about that face, and that guy, and that voice, and... Uh, I do have a soft spot for Clint Weiss with the actor, but I think it's incredible how he's developed into such a director. Now let's, I'm going to shoehorn something in that we didn't plan, but I have to talk about it. I had an incredible string of trailers on my print of Trouble with the Curve. Yeah. We went from Lincoln from Spielberg, which looks incredible. Right. We had 42, the Jackie Robinson movie, which I was completely unaware of and surprised at how Harrison Ford looks. And then I had Argo, which... I have been saying for a few years now, I think Ben Affleck is our next Clint Eastwood. He's a fine actor who I really like as an actor, but when he steps behind the camera, he hits a sweet spot for me, and I am geeked about Argo. And I didn't even think when I wrote that down about the parallel between him and Eastwood, but I think he's the next actor-turned-director who has Oscars coming. I cannot agree with you more. We, are, we resonate perfectly with that. I'm a huge Affleck fan when he steps behind the camera. Um, I, it's just slipping my mind. The first, the first, Gone Baby Gone. 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 Yeah. Oh my goodness! It's one of the best movies I've ever seen. I mean, it's yeah. just incredible. And uh, and then of course uh, the town. You know, was just he just he really understands how to own an audience. And really, as a director, I think that's the primary trait you kind of have to figure out is how do you grab the audience and take them exactly where you want them to go. Yeah. And he has a hold of that. And I agree that Argo trailer is great. Um, I really liked the the 42 trailer, the Jackie Robinson. I, I got a little choked up just from know, the trailer. I know, and I've never seen Harrison Ford that unrecognizable yeah. in my life. I'm kind of excited to see that, and it came out of the blue for me. So Anyway, yeah. sorry to get us off track. Here. No, no, that's good stuff. I love talking about that stuff. Uh, best thing, worst thing? Okay. Uh, we will start with worst thing and move to best thing. I will start this time. Um, my worst thing that I have written down, and you've already touched on it, is the telegraphed side stuff. Um, and this is maybe a little more specific than what you mentioned, but there's a plot line that kind of gives away a little bit. It's a little spoilery to talk about, but it's just so ham-fisted and telegraphed, and the actors that are playing these these uh, high school students, I, they're just, they're bad. They're just really bad, and it just, that took me out of the movie, um, especially the guy that plays the, the hot prospect, the hitter kid. I just... I mean, I, f I feel bad saying it, but I just that was not a great performance. Well, it took me out of the movie in that final game when all of a sudden, without having done any of it before, we're brought into those kids' world, 
and we see the nerd who's about to go up to bat get bullied by the good player, and then we follow that nerd for a couple of one-liners under his breath, and I'm like, who is this guy? We've not right. right. This is the bad news bears, and that's not the movie I was in. And yeah. so that was a little bizarre, but um, <laughs> I felt like I felt like that stuff. My my presiding thought was that stuff could have just been subtle and underneath and not so spelled out, and it might have been better. Like we would have gotten the same idea from what happened. We didn't. We just didn't need it. It drawn so clearly. I don't know. It just felt like it could have been handled much in a much well, more subtle way. And and that's my least favorite thing. Everything is everything is too perfect. Um, whether whether we're talking about the contrived plot things or simply tying up all the loose ends, I, th I think I wrote down, if at any point during this movie you're watching and you fear that something bad might happen, your fear is completely unwarranted. Everything <laughs> works out perfectly for everyone. And, it, and that speaks to the greater issue of, I feel like the plot was pretty uninspired. I feel like it was, you know, pulling a few cliches from here and there. And then let's put them together in a way that works out perfectly. It just was a little too. Everything was a little too easy. Um, I don't know if that is boiled down enough to be a worse thing, but uh, yeah, I think so. What's your best thing? My best thing is Eastwood, um, and and right below that I wrote Adams and almost made it her because I really thought she was good. And there's a lot of things that she's done in the past, even when she's been great, that I was worried she was going to bring to this role, and she didn't. I was really impressed with her, but he's just. He's just great. There's, it's like it's like Al Pacino. There's a reason they're typecast in these kind of roles because they're the best at it. And uh, he was really good and kept me connected to the movie. If that had been a poor performance, they would have lost me. Uh, my best thing goes right along with yours. My best thing was the father-daughter stuff. Those scenes, and we've talked about this a little bit, but those scenes where um, there, there are two primary scenes that I'm thinking of where they are head-to-head, face-to-face, -to -face, talking about their relationship uh, they are so good as actors, and in those moments, this movie sings better than it sings anywhere else. Yep. And um, and again, I think if uh, you connect with that emotionally, you're going to really like this movie because it's just those are some powerful scenes. And and I thought the the kind of the crisis point of their relationship, not to give anything away, I thought that was handled well. Too, like how it was a little more subtly introduced and revealed to us when we needed to know it, and um, I thought I thought that was handled better than much of the side stuff. In the I would movie. agree. Yeah, I would agree. So that was my best thing. All right. Well, let's uh, let's finish with when to see. Okay. Uh, and the choices, as always, are immediately, soon, on DVD, uh, if you see it on TV, or never. Yeah, I gotta go with DVD on this one. Um, not not the kind of investment I walk out of the theater really happy I spent that eight dollars or whatever you pay for your local theater, but you catch it on DVD or later on TV. Obviously, you feel like you're getting a bargain because there is some entertainment value there, uh, but but there's there's not really anything there that's going to surprise you that you haven't seen before somewhere. So that's why I'm putting it at DVD. And it sounds like DVD and maybe wait till it's like in the five dollar bin at Walmart kind yeah, maybe, of thing. Yeah, you could go that route too. <laughs> If you want. Um, again, I liked it a little more than you. I really struggled with saying DVD or maybe even soon because I think there is some stuff there that you might want to check out. I think at the end of the day I'm going to go ahead and go with soon. Uh, I think it's a movie worth seeing if for no other reason than the performances and especially if you're going to connect to it emotionally. I think you, it, it really might mean something to you um, if you're in a father-daughter relationship or an estranged relationship or something like that. Um, I'd say see it soon. So that's what I would say. All right. All right, uh, let's see. We will go to next week so we can pick what we're going to watch and review okay. here next Friday. We do this every Friday at 5 o'clock if you want to watch it live on YouTube. And then, of course, it's on YouTube whenever you want to check it out after that. Uh, next week, the movies that are out are Looper, uh, Hotel Transylvania, and Won't Back Down are the three main ones that we'll be releasing next week. Well, I'm going to vote for Looper, and I'm going to vote for Looper twice. <laughs> but oh, you, I don't know what Won't Back Down is, so maybe you can change my mind. Uh, Won't Back Down does look a little interesting. I think that's Maggie Gyllenhaal, and she's like a, a mom whose student is having trouble at school, and it's kind of, I think it's another Oscar bait type movie. Okay. Um, but again, uh, I like to mix it up, and I'm completely with you on Looper. Loop, Looper looks fascinating to me. It does. It looks like a great high-concept sci-fi movie, and I love those. Absolutely, and man, if I'm not falling in love with Joseph Gordon-Levitt this year. Great. 
I mean, I already like the dude, and then he's got his performance in Dark Knight Rises is great. Did you see? You probably didn't see Premium Rush. No, no. Surprisingly good movie. I mean, yeah. it looks just like something you just throw out there because it was made and you don't have anything to do with it. Right. And I really enjoyed it. Like, it reminded me of, like, one of those old school movies where you just have a good time the whole movie, wondering, you know, how it's going to resolve and what's going to happen next, you know? Isn't that David Cup or Cup or however you say his name, the guy that was involved with the Jurassic Park movie? I think that, I think that had a writer-director that, that made it more interesting to me than the trailers. The trailers looked like a throwaway, you know, straight-to-DVD movie. They do, oh. but he's great in it. Joseph Gordon-Levitt's great in it, and I thought it was a lot of fun. The The main bad guy is awful. I mean, so over-the-top awful. But it's somehow it works. I mean, it's just kind of one of those things where, um, I don't know, I walked away really enjoying it. Well, it, may I, have been lo- it may have been low expectations, too. I'm, yeah, he's on a hot streak. Sci-fi is always good. Bruce Willis, I'm not sure what else you need to sell me on Looper. I'm, I'm there whether we review it or not, so... All right, we will do Looper next week, and uh, we hope you'll be around as well. Again, you can uh, catch these reviews at 5 o'clock on Friday. That's Central, so 6 o'clock Eastern, uh, what, 3 o'clock Pacific. I'll just go around the world, give every time zone. That way everybody knows. Plenty of time. Uh, And uh, and then whenever you want to check it out at YouTube. Thanks, Jeremy. I appreciate your time, man. Thanks, Aaron. We'll do it next week. All right, we'll see you then. Take care.